Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all for attending. Um, uh, my name is Mansur Hussein, and I'm privileged to chair this workshop uh, uh, this morning, which is hosted by the Ted Rogers Center for uh, Heart Research. Um, this is a, uh, a priority area of research for the Ted Rogers Center of Heart Research, the topic at hand, namely the uh, study of uh, genetics uh, in cardiovascular disease. And we thought we'd try to bring together um, uh, some real experts in the field, which is, does not include me. Uh, I think uh, the best place for the chair is to not be the expert, uh, but to really be the, um, if you will, the discussant, uh, to bring the experts together. Uh, on this topic myself, I have no uh, relevant disclosures. Uh, I want to begin by thanking the planning committee, which uh, includes several of the speakers you're going to hear from this morning. Uh, that's uh, Professor Seema Mittal at Sick Kids, uh, Melanie Kerr, uh, at the University Health Network, and uh, Professor Raymond Kim, who's not able to be here uh, this morning, uh, and also Marie Shea, who's a PhD candidate in our program uh, focusing on adult congenital heart disease. So I'm very grateful to her as the trainee representative on the planning committee. Our faculty is widely representative. We are really privileged to have three genetic counselors who deal with this topic on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in, their, in their work, uh, speaking to uh, physicians and patients and their families, about the subject matter at hand. We're also absolutely delighted uh, to welcome uh, here today a patient who has a specific a personal, uh, if you will, relationship with the subject at hand. And we're actually going to be hearing from Heather Cartwright uh, as we begin our panel discussion about what this topic really means uh, uh, to, to a patient and, and to, their, to their family. Um, so our agenda is fairly straightforward. Uh, to make this as interactive as possible, we wanted to do this in the context of two cases. We're first going to have an overview from Melanie Kerr about the topic at hand, i.e. genetics and cardiovascular disease. And then we're going to have two cases, the first presented by Josh and Seema together as a tandem, talking about a uh, teenage athlete who has a collapse during a basketball game and what we do for the workup of this rather scary event that's not that uncommon. Uh, anybody practicing in cardiology has had a story like this and wants to know what to do about a case like this. And the second, which is a perhaps not yet common case in your office, but we believe going to be more common as the direct-to-consumer genetic testing area takes off. We believe, and we're going to poll you, uh, to see how many of you have encountered where a patient comes to you and says, I've had a direct-to-consumer genetic test, and this is what's been identified, and what you should do about that as a cardiologist in your practice. And then we're going to have a panel discussion where we hope to answer any questions that come up during this process. I want to make it interactive. Uh, we do have audience participation. If I could ask you all to grab your cell phones, go in the browser, to ccc2018.cnf.io. And once you type that in, you'll be taken to a site where you can select this morning's session, our session, genetics, uh, and get ready to answer questions. The questions will appear when I uh, pose them on the interactive. So for example, I don't know how many of you are from Toronto, but if you're not, you're still available to answer this question objectively. Uh, who will win the Stanley Cup this year? This is a test of the audience response system. Is it number one, Toronto Maple Leafs, two, the Calgary Flames, three, the Montreal Canadiens, or four, the Vancouver Canucks? And this is what will appear when we connect. You'll have 15 seconds to submit your answers. Well, I was limited to four, but... Uh, And uh, thank you very much uh, for, I'm from Calgary myself, but, uh, uh, but I've spent now longer in Toronto than I did in Calgary, so uh, I, uh, the audience is always right. Uh, so our objectives are, we're going to outline the clinical utility of genetic testing, a broad overview, uh, and review what genetic testing may be appropriate for a patient with a known heart disease. We're going to dive a little deeper into that area, that's probably the most relevant. And then I think the more challenging part, but we want to take on this challenge, is how we might interpret genetic test results and clinical implications for patient and family, including direct-to-consumer genetic testing. So now I'm going to invite uh, 
my colleague, Melanie Kerr from the University Health Network. Melanie is very experienced genetic counselor specializing in cardiovascular disease. Thanks very Melanie. much, Dr. Hussain. Um, so my job this morning is just to give you a very brief overview uh, about genetic testing in the field of cardiovascular disease. Um, I have no disclosures to report. And just before we start, wanted to get uh, a, a gauge of the temperature in the room to, to ask you what kind of access to genetic testing and genetic services you have in your community. So that's the question, is do you have access to genetic testing in your community and in your practices? And the responses here would be, uh, yes, I have easy access to genetic, uh, genetics clinic or genetic counselor. Uh, option number two, I have access to a genetics clinic, but it's difficult and it's slow. Uh, no, I do not uh, have access, but I know who to call to gain access for my patients. Or fourth response is no, I do not have access to a genetics clinic uh, and do not even know who to call. So if you want to think about that for a moment, you've got 15 seconds to answer that question. And remember okay. to press well, submit. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, around the room it looks like, yes, there is access to genetics, but it's difficult and it's slow, which I think is uh, not an un uncommon uh, response in this scenario. Um, you'll notice here, though, that there are a number of people who don't actually have access and aren't sure who even to call. So I think that's something that really needs to be addressed uh, overall moving forward as we um, become more bombarded uh, with information both in the um, Popular, popular media medical literature about the value of genetics and genetic testing in the diagnosis uh, and risk assessment of patients with cardiovascular disease. And I think it's a difficult field to navigate in some ways. And so what we're hoping to do is really um, speak a little bit to these questions when it comes to genetic testing and this particular subject is sort of who are the right patients to consider genetic services or genetic testing for, why you might want to do that kind of testing for these patients, what test is the correct test to offer or what is the correct uh, path to go in terms of genetics and how do I access those services for my patients? So when we're talking about genetics and, and heart disease, I think it's important to sort of break this into a couple of broad categories. The first one uh, would be those kind of rare single gene disorders. These are the conditions uh, the cardiomyopathies and the arrhythmia syndromes that really uh, are what you hear about in terms of those dramatic events often. So those young athletes who die suddenly uh, on soccer pitches. Um, and uh, these, are, these are the conditions that you might see a couple of in your practice, probably not going to be struck with every single day, as opposed to the second category, which are the much more common things that we would see in a general cardiology practice, including things like atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease that affect quite uh, a higher prevalence of individuals in the population. So just to break those down a little bit further, we talk about rare monogenic disorders. I think the key word here is rare. Uh, the most common would be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a prevalence of about one in 500 individuals, but they, some of the more uh, un uncommon arrhythmia syndromes can be as rare as one in 10,000. Um, when it comes to the genetics of these conditions, they are all, I want you to think back now to sort of genetics 101. Uh, these are autosomal dominant conditions whereby a person who carries an alteration or a mutation in one copy of a disease associated gene is a person that is at risk to develop that condition. Um, I say at risk because all of these conditions display what we call variable penetrance and expressivity, meaning that not every person who carries the, the gene mutation will ultimately develop the condition, uh, and those that do can be affected quite differently. So they can be, uh, occur, the onset can be at different ages. We see from young age to early, uh, to older ages in terms of onset, and with different degrees of severity. So. Um, when you have a patient or a person that is affected with one of these conditions because of the autosomal dominant inheritance, each of their children, siblings and parents are at a 50% risk to also carry that same alteration or mutation that puts them at increased risk. And this here is just to highlight the fact that uh, these, um, these genes or these conditions generally are associated with well-defined genes for which there is good evidence for a disease 
disease gene association. So good evidence to show that the gene in question actually does put that person at significant increased risk for that particular condition. And so in the population, you're going to see rarely people are affected with these. So an individual in blue, for example, in this particular slide is affected. There's not very many of them in the general population overall, uh, and they're, they're likely to carry these causative disease gene variants. And while you can see people that carry one of those disease-causing mutations um, that doesn't have the condition, that doesn't happen quite as often. Um, so we see relatively high risk for gene carriers in this particular population. So with the second group that we're going to talk about today, which are the more common multifactorial conditions, um, gen genetics and genes are one of the many risk factors that play a role. Uh, we certainly have multiple genes that can come into play here, environmental factors, modifications to genes that occur over time. And these kinds of uh, conditions are associated, the genes associated with these particular conditions are associated with either increased or decreased risk to develop the condition, but of smaller magnitudes. So what you would see here in the population is you see the affected individuals are much more prevalent. We see all the, all the blue individuals on this slide. Um, and so again, things you might see commonly in your practice, um, the associated gene variant in question is carried by some of those people, but there are a lot of affected individuals in the population who don't carry that gene variant. And vice versa, you see people that aren't affected, many more people that aren't affected that might also carry that gene variant. So it's just a, a different um, thought process when it comes to the genetics associated with these two different groups of conditions. So very briefly, you know, I think one of the questions that we hear a lot is genetic testing, isn't it just a blood test? Why, what do we ha really have to think about here? And while, yes, it, it technically is just a blood test or even in some cases a saliva test, which we're seeing a lot more of, there are some things to think about that are different between these two groups. So monogenic disorders, this is genetic testing that is typically clinically available. Um, however, it's important to be aware there are discrepancies regarding availability across the country. The interpretation of these results are highly dependent on the accurate phenotype and diagnosis of the person in front of you. Um, and that's key. And, and uh, Josh and Dr. Mattel will talk about that as well. And that there is a significantly increased risk associated with the presence of a disease-associated gene variant. Whereas with multifactorial conditions, these are really tests that are not particularly clinically available right now. And that's uh, an area that Dr. Uh, Hussein and Eriska will talk about. Um, these are tests that come in the form of these more direct-to-consumer things we hear about, like 23andMe. Um, and the associated risks are generally related to odds ratios um, based on what evidence is available about disease gene association, but also to be cautious that the evidence associating some of those genes with these conditions is not always that strong. So there are certainly um, limitations to what this kind of information can provide you. So moving forward, we're going to highlight some of these points for you. We're going to start, I'm going to introduce my colleagues, Dr. Seema Mattel and Dr. Josh, uh, Mr. Josh Silver, <laughs> sorry Josh, <laughs> um, to come and talk about genetic testing for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Thank you, Melanie, and good morning, everyone. So we will, we will talk about genetic testing for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but just to, uh, to make the case that the principles or guidelines that will be discussed in relationship to cardiomyopathy can apply to most monogenic disorders. Uh, we, myself and Josh, have no disclosures. So let's start out with a case uh, that, that one would commonly, one might commonly see. So this is a 16-year-old boy who had a syncopal episode during a basketball game. The resting ECG showed voltage criteria for LV hypertrophy. The echo showed basal septal hypertrophy to the tune of 22 millimeters in diameter. On physical exam, there were no obvious systemic abnormalities. However, when we did a deeper dive into the family history, it became obvious that there was a family history of unexplained sudden cardiac death at a relatively young age on the paternal side. So the paternal uncle and the paternal grandfather had, had episodes of sudden unexplained cardiac, or sun, sudden unexplained death. So we went on to, to do a workup to rule out secondary causes of LV hypertrophy, which includes ruling out hypertension, aortic valve abnormalities, as well as athlete's heart. In addition, workup was done, uh, which included a neurological exam to, to rule out neuromuscular disorders that can be associated with cardiomyopathy, malformation syndromes, blood work was done to rule out inborn errors of metabolism, and cardiac MRI to rule out infiltrative disorders like amyloidosis. 
With this, with the negative workup, we were left with the diagnosis of primary or isolated hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which, as Melanie explained, is an autosomal dominant condition. It is highly polygenic. In other words, overall, there are uh, hundreds, upwards of 100 genes involved in different types of cardiomyopathy, although <clears throat> a smaller number cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. <coughs> and importantly, there is significant inter- and intrafamilial variability in the age of onset, severity, and progression of disease, and there can be incomplete or reduced penetrance in any given family member. So I'd like to move forward with an audience response question. And the question here is, what would be the next diagnostic steps in the workup of this 16-year-old uh, boy with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? And I will, what I would want you to do is choose the incorrect statement. So the first question is, screen all first-degree relatives of the 16-year-old with an echo and ECG. Second, screen all first-degree relatives of the other family members who had sudden cardiac death with echo ECG. Refer the patient to genetic services for genetic counseling and genetic testing. And number four, offer genetic testing to all family members. So please go ahead and vote. Don't forget to hit submit. That is very interesting results. Um, so uh, this is nice to know that the audience actually has uh, identified the incorrect statement. So it's, it's absolutely true. Whenever you see a, a proband or index case with cardiomyopathy, we definitely want to screen all the first degree relatives with echo ECGs. And also the, the relatives of, uh, sudden of other members in the family who've had sudden cardiac events. Important to refer for genetic testing, but really only the proband in this case because the yield in genetic testing is going to be highest in a phenotype positive member, and unaffected members should not be used as for screening for genetic test results unless the proband is, turns out to have a positive result. So I'm going to move forward and have um, Josh take over um, how to go about genetic testing. So over the last several years, there have been a number of different guidelines published on the utility of genetic testing for patients with uh, cardiomyopathies and primary arrhythmias. And we'd like to highlight uh, one particular position statement by the Canadian Cardiovascular Society and Canadian Heart Rhythm Society. Um, and the, the key points from this article list that, first of all, diagnostic evaluation for suspected hereditary cardiomyopathy should be performed by a physician expert who's well-versed in both the clinical and genetic aspects of cardiomyopathy. Decisions regarding the utility of genetic testing should be made in collaboration with the genetic counselor. Prior to pursuing genetic testing, patients should receive comprehensive pretest genetic counseling, which would include a discussion of the psychological, social, and ethical implications of genetic testing. And genetic testing should not be ordered on asymptomatic family members in the absence of a parallel clinical assessment with a physician expert. The role of the cardiologist in the genetic diagnosis of cardiomyopathy includes, of course, first of all, making a clinical diagnosis of cardiomyopathy. Uh, as Dr. Mittal mentioned, performing a baseline workup to exclude secondary causes of cardiomyopathy, and also referring to genetic services for pretest counseling. And that might be to a traditional medical genetics clinic or to a specialized genetic counselor who is embedded within a cardiology clinic. Um, the traditional home of genetic counselors has been the medical genetics clinic, but over uh, in recent years, genetic counselors have become increasingly more specialized uh, to certain organ systems, and you now, in especially in tertiary care centers, tend to uh, or more often find genetic counselors embedded within cardiology clinics. Um, there's still only a few within Canada, but it does exist. Um, and the role of the genetic counselor includes performing genetic risk assessment and offering pretest counseling to the patient and the family, interpreting genetic test results and returning those results to the patient, facilitating communication of genetic risk between the patient and their family members, um, and of course offering familial cascade testing, which is offering genetic testing for pathogenic gene mutations to unaffected family members. And in some cases, genetic counselors may be involved in a research capacity as well. As you can see here, I've uh, listed the cities in Canada that I know have a specialized genetic, cardiac genetic counselor involved. 
uh, either embedded within a cardiology clinic or in a traditional medi medical genetics clinic. Uh, there may be a number of different rural outreach clinics as well that I don't have a complete list of, but suffice to say, if you see your city on this list, you do have access to a cardiac genetic counselor. So next audience question. So the um, patient that we presented at the beginning, what would you feel is the most appropriate genetic test to offer to the 16-year-old patient? Number one, a targeted hypertrophic cardiomyopathy panel. Number two, a so-called pancardiomyopathy panel, including genes associated with other types of cardiomyopathy, whole exome sequencing, or whole genome sequencing. Uh, so most of you chose a uh, targeted hypertrophic cardiomyopathy panel. While it's not necessarily unreasonable to offer a pancardiomyopathy panel, uh, I will discuss some limitations of arranging that kind of a test. Um, whole genome sequencing, we're not there yet, but that's something that might come down the pipeline in the next five to ten years. So a targeted HCM panel is the correct response in this case. So particularly in the context of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arranging expanded so-called pancardiomyopathy panels tends to offer limited additional sensitivity. As you can see here, about 70% of cases of HCM are caused by mutations in three to five genes that are involved in coding the sarcomere. Also, doing genetic testing on genes that are not clearly associated with the phenotype of the patient is more likely to give you uh, increased background noise, which, we're which I'm going to talk about more shortly. If you start looking into the various options for genetic testing, you'll find that there's a significant amount of variability in terms of genetic testing panels. Um, so panels may be targeted to, this, to a specific phenotype, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or uh, you may see expanded panels that include uh, genes associated with various types of cardiomyopathies. The gene content uh, from, can vary significantly from lab to lab, so you might find that an HCM panel may include only five genes, or it could incl include as many as 19 genes. The interpretation of uh, genetic variants can vary significantly between laboratories, and as Melanie mentioned earlier, access to genetic testing can vary considerably um, based on geographical location. So if you've, you've arranged your genetic testing panel, what are the three possible results you might receive? Uh, first of all, you could get a positive result indicating that a pathogenic or a likely pathogenic gene variant has been identified. It can come back negative, no pathogenic variant has been identified, or you can get an inconclusive result where a variant of unknown clinical significance has been identified where there is insufficient or conflicting evidence for the pathogenicity of this variant. So looking at our family that we presented initially, uh, the scenario number one is a pathogenic variant has been identified in the MYBPC3 gene. This confirms an underlying hereditary cause of HCM in this family. In this particular situation, this will not result in a change of medical management to the proband or the uh, presenting patient in this family. However, Identifying a pathogenic variant does facilitate um, offering cascade testing to family members, which allows accurate family risk assessment. So as you can see here, we show that the sister and the mother have tested negative for the mutation and now can be discharged from cardiology follow-up, whereas the father and cousin uh, have tested positive and they now need intensive cardiology follow-up, typically annually. The test could come back negative, uh, no pathogenic variants were identified. This does not exclude, first of all, a clinical diagnosis of hypertrophic cardio cardiomyopathy, and a hereditary cause of cardiomyopathy has not been ruled out. As you can see in this table, genetic testing for pretty much all hereditary causes of, in, of cardiac disease, the sensitivity of genetic testing does not reach 100%. And for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in particular, we're looking at a pickup rate of about 35 to 
So a negative result does not rule out hereditary cardiomyopathy and at-risk family members require a comprehensive cardiac evaluation and ongoing cardiology follow-up. So in the family that we're discussing, who are the at-risk family members? In this case, it's the first-degree relatives of the index case as well as the first-degree relatives of the individuals with sudden death. The third scenario, a variant of unknown clinical significance is identified in the MYBPC3 gene. This is an inconclusive result, and it should not influence clinical management of the index case or the family members. Surveillance of all potentially at-risk family members does need to continue, and ongoing interpretation of this gene variant is critical um, to assess the need for reclassification over time. So uh, gene variant interpretation of pathogenicity falls on a spectrum ranging anywhere from benign to unknown to pathogenic. And there are a number of different factors that genetic counselors and laboratories use to determine whether a variant may be pathogenic. Um, and a discussion of these different factors is beyond the scope of today's talk. Suffice to say that interpretation of genetic test results can and does change over time. And it is not unheard of for pathogenic variants to be reinterpreted as benign over time, which can have significant imp implications for family members, uh, particularly those who have tested negative for the variant and have been discharged from cardiology follow-up. Um, and this is a service that genetic counselors do offer, um, interpretation of genetic test results over time. So to summarize what we've discussed in terms of approaching a new patient with cardiomyopathy, uh, one would start out with a detailed three-generation family history or pedigree. Also, a workup to rule out secondary causes of cardiomyopathy, which include metabolic and neuromuscular causes. And if those are found, then appropriate referral to specialists should be made. On the other hand, if it turns out to be a primary cardiomyopathy, then as we discussed, uh, we would offer panel testing in conjunction with genetic counseling for HCM. Specifically, it would be panel testing. If a pathogenic mutation is identified, then offer cascade testing to the first degree family members. But if no pathogenic mutation is identified, then continue with clinical screening of all first degree relatives, typically every three years or so. What I also wanted to highlight was that the management of a cardiomyopathy patient is not just the management of the patient, but really management of the family and does require a multidisciplinary team. And that includes not just a cardiologist who's well-versed in heart failure and cardiomyopathy, but an electrophysiologist to make the appropriate recommendations for an ICD, if that's indicated, advanced imaging techniques, clinical geneticist, and a genetic counselor. And very important is that this is a, a, a rapidly evolving field, and genetics is beginning to play more and more of a role in the manage, or we hope in the next few years, we'll be playing more of a role in the management, not just of the family members, but of the patient themselves. There are emerging technologies, so wearable technologies is something offered to cardiomyopathy patients in general over the years, but there can be gene-targeted therapies. For example, myosin-targeted therapies are being, are in clinical trials, phase one and two clinical trials for dilated and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that may become relevant depending on whether you have a myosin mutation or not. There is also trials underway for offering preemptive therapy to, page, to individuals who are gene positive but phenotype negative to delay or defer the onset of their of a clinical phenotype. And in the future, gene editing or gene correction may actually offer a cure for cardiomyopathy. So it's important to keep abreast of these uh, emerging therapies and give an option for patients to even participate in some of the trials. So the final thoughts, back to Josh. So just a, a few things that we want you to remember from this talk. Uh, first of all, managing cardiomyopathy is about treating not just the patient, but the whole family. Uh, in terms of uh, key points from genetic testing, it should almost always begin on an affected family member. Uh, it should not be performed in an unaffected family member unless a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant is identified in the index case. Um, Positive genetic test results may but do not always impact medical management of the affected family member. Um, medical management is more likely to be impacted based on genetic test results in the case of the hereditary arrhythmias, which we didn't discuss in detail today. Um, negative and inclusive, inconclusive results do not rule out a hereditary cause, and at-risk relatives still need ongoing cardiology follow-up, and interpretation of genetic test results is dynamic and can, cha can change over time. Finally, management of cardiomyopathy requires a multidisciplinary team approach. Um, we've left you with a few references and that are, we think, well worthwhile to read on this topic if you're interested. 
Okay. Thank you very much. So we're going to have time for a panel discussion if any of you have questions about that case and, and the implications. Uh, and now uh, Ariska and I are going to take you through the second case. Come on up, Ariska. So my patient brought her genetic test result in help. And we believe why we chose this case is we believe this is going to become more and more likely to happen, uh, even to a cardiologist who's never had to deal with it before. So this is a case of a 52-year-old female <clears throat> referred by her general practitioner because a direct-to-consumer genetic test that she had, which was a gift to her from her family at Christmas, uh, identified her at being at increased risk for coronary artery disease. This is the definition of a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> she's asking what she must do to reduce her risk, she's come to you, the cardiologist, and whether this test can be used by her family to inform their need for prevention. So as a good cardiologist should do, you start with the history and physical. So this is an active woman, has no symptoms whatsoever, no relevant past medical history, she's a non-smoker and takes no medications. This is really out of the blue genetic test that identifies a risk. Her mother, however, did have a stroke at age 68, which is just 10 years later than her age now, and her father had a myocardial infarction in his mid-70s. Her brother, who's younger than her, but who smoked, had an angioplasty at age 48. So there is a family history. One could argue whether it's premature or normal degenerative age onset of cardiovascular disease in first degree relatives all over the place, parents and sibling. Her blood pressure is 138 over 84. She's overweight, BMI of 28. Her A1C is normal at 5.9, but at the upper limit of normal. Her LDL is not that high, 3.3, and her total cholesterol to HDL ratio is not that bad, 3.7. This clearly isn't an overt dyslipidemia, which can run in families. Uh, and you haven't identified something really ominous here. This is a pretty typical patient that most postmenopausal you know, patients with atypical chest pain might be presenting with. In this case, she's completely asymptomatic. Her ECG, however, which is a very common, I call this the most common general cardiology clinical referral, uh, usually, however, with some story of chest pain, shows some nonspecific anterior T-wave flattening, which those of you who practice general cardiology will know very common in perimenopausal women and often results in a lot of diagnostic testing. So audience interactive question number four. This is really to, again, take the temperature of the room. How many patients have come to your practice with a direct-to-consumer genetic test report or have asked your opinion about ordering one. So one, none, two, some, or three patients frequently have asked or brought results to my clinic, which I think would be unlikely, but our prediction would be over the next five years, this might actually emerge. So here's your opportunity to answer. Okay, so this is, you know, I think very revealing. This is kind of what I would predicted, that some people have had this question asked to them or have actually encountered this where a patient has brought. But the majority of you, this hasn't happened to you yet. All right. So before I hand it over to Ariska, I thought I would give you a very quick glimpse into how busy this field is. And in fact, this is not a comprehensive list. This is actually just the beginning. On the very left-hand side is what's popular. You, hear, you see the ads on television. You see them on the back of magazines or in newspapers, and that's 23andMe. Their business is to inform you about your genetic risk for certain diseases. That's what they do. They charge $249, and they do what's called a SNP genotyping. Ariska is going to go into this in more detail. Looking for single nucleotide polymorphisms, in many ways, the postal code of the entire genome. Not your address, but your postal code. In the middle are those companies that do a little bit more. Color is probably the most well-known for the same price. You get a little bit more information. Genos, Helix, Dante Labs, full genomes with 
full genome sequencing, Invitae and Veritas are probably the most, the ones with the asterisks are those that uh, on many levels are clinically approved. Ariska will talk about that more in detail. Then there are some companies where if you happen to have your sequence, you can simply submit it and get their opinion because they're annotating and forever updating what a certain sequence variation may mean in coding sequence, i.e. segments of the genome that code for genes, and even now what's emerging is information that's in the non-coding, what we used to call junk DNA, is far from junk, it actually contains important information, and genome map. And insight genetics would offer not only this type of insight, but suggest ancillary testing that could be done, blood testing, et cetera. So a complicated field, lots of opportunity. One could see a particularly hypochondriacal patient doing more than one and bringing you more than one result in. And this, you know, you don't need a prescription for this, ladies and gentlemen. You can just send your spit in and get this result. So here's an example of something that could be pretty frightening. What if your patient Clark came in today with this 23andMe report, which says, Clark, you have one copy of the apolipoprotein E, or epsilon-4 variant, which is a marker of late-onset Alzheimer's disease. So perfectly healthy person now faces the prospect, Doc, I'm going to get Alzheimer's. What do we do together? This is real. This is a real result that a patient can get. Or they can come in with a color report that says, Pathogenic mutation was identified in BRCA. BRCA is pretty well known in the commonplace. The risk for breast and ovarian cancer in women includes risk for breast cancer in men. Uh, and, uh, you know, women with a family history may want this testing, even though the guidelines for that testing are not entirely clear or not, uh, would not indicate that, but patients can get this directly. So with this, I'm going to turn over to Ariska. So we're switching gears a little bit here with um, this next case. In the previous case, we were talking about uh, clinically derived or standard of care genetic testing, whereas in this case, we're talking about something that, as uh, Dr. Hussein mentioned, is likely to become more and more prevalent, which is uh, patient derived or a sort of patient requested genetic testing. And these are not necessarily patients or people that come into your clinics with, with disease. These are also healthy individuals who are interested in practicing, um, you know, preventative medicine and, and obtaining more information about their potential genetic risks. So what is direct-to-consumer uh, genetic testing? Well, as we mentioned, this in general is patient-initiated, so in other words, not physician-mediated. Um, I will say that many companies, um, like Dr. Hussein mentioned, are sort of evolving and starting to incorporate medical professionals and healthcare professionals into their model. Um, so although it might appear that a test is ordered by a physician, we have to be careful and recognize that a lot of these companies are bringing the physicians in-house into their companies to do the ordering or con uh, consulting on these tests. Uh, this is a test that is paid for out of pocket, so this is an important point. This is not a test that is ministry approved or covered by uh, government funding. Um, and this is a test that can include genetic testing for risk factors associated with both minimal or significant uh, impact, depending on the lab or the technology used. So the etiology of cardiac disease is complex. We know there are both genetic and environmental risk factors. So uh, the genetic risk factors um, can vary. There can be significant genetic impact, um, where in, such as in the case of a genetic syndrome or genetic disorder, or there can be more low-risk um, genetic alleles um, or associations, um, and we can have both common and rare risk alleles. In the environment, we know that there are many impacts or triggers, such as diet and stress and lifestyle. And we know that when those two come together, the interaction between those genetic environmental risk factors is when we can develop cardiac disease. So we call this multifactorial inheritance. And this can be visualized nicely using the, the CUP model by Huang et al., uh, 2017. And so here we see that there's different impact depending on the, uh, the genetic risk factor. So 
The red circle indicates a strong genetic risk factor. The blue ones, they're weak, and the small purple ones are the environmental factors. And the point that we see here is that combined, um, they can re reach a critical threshold for disease and develop uh, coronary artery disease, for example. To illustrate sort of three different potential outcomes here, you can see the first one on the left, the high impact um, genetic impact is um, seen where there's a, a, a genetic risk allele such as the um, um, uh, gene associated with familial hypercholesterolemia where it's a significant impact and in fact even in, on its own a person can develop cardio, um, coronary artery disease. In the second model you see that the individual genetic risk factors actually have a low impact but together can add up to create the crit or to reach a critical threshold. And then finally, importantly, you can see that even though an individual can have a, a genetic risk factor in and of itself, they may not ever actually reach a critical threshold or develop the disease. So it's important to recognize that even having a genetic risk factor does not necessarily mean that an individual will have the disease or coronary artery disease. So how are the labs actually going about using this um, uh, information and testing for these different types of genetic risk factors? So some companies that we talked about, like 23andMe, use the approach of the single nucleotide polymorphism um, test or looking for the common variants that are located um, in specific locations throughout the genome. So these types of what we call SNPs are associated with making, you know, having people be unique in their appearance, in their susceptibility to disease, and even in their response to certain types of medications. So these, the yellow dots indicate um, where the specific locations across the genome, where they are, and specific labs will only actually test for those particular locations in the genome. And basically this is what would, would incur sort of a susceptibility to disease or indicate a low impact. This is different from something like genome sequencing, which is actually looking at all of the DNA in a gene and looking for more rare type of variants that would indicate an individual may have a, a genetic disorder or genetic syndrome. And these are types of genetic changes that would have a very high impact. So taking this information, we move back to our case and to our patient. So, our patient feels that they're at increased risk, and but what does increased risk actually mean? So this can mean very different things to different people depending on their perspective, of course, and can be quite intimidating and scary. And also it can mean very different things depending on the lab that was used and the technology that was used. So here I have two different quotes of, of an increased risk from two different labs using two di very different types of technology. The first one is a quote from 23andMe which does not go about diagnosing disease, but instead um, gives risk assessment to the patient. So here they've come back with a result that says you have a slightly increased risk of developing disorder X based on your genetic test result. On the other hand, you could have a result, the second quote is from Color, um, a pathogenic mutation was identified in the LDLR gene, testing positive for a pathogenic mutation in this gene causes familiar, familial hypercholesterolemia. So again, you can see the difference there in the impact that the different test has. One is stating a slightly increased risk and the other is actually identifying that this individual has a genetic condition. So it's very important to understand, you know, as illustrated, what the actual test was looking at, what technology they used. So step one, what kind of test was run? This is a question you might ask yourself if a patient presents in your clinic with a report from a uh, direct-to-consumer genetic testing company. Step one would be what, was, what test was run and recognizing that all, not all tests are equal. Was it a test that looked for common variants or SNPs as we've discussed? Or is this a test that actually performed <laughs> genetic sequencing? So the common variant type of approach, like we've discussed with 23andMe, looks for a very specific common genetic variants. They can assess disease risk association. It's typically not used for diagnostic purposes and in general would not be used for family testing. 
Whereas a test that uses gene sequencing, uh, like the example we used of, of the lab color, they do look for rare genetic variants and can be used for diagnostic purposes, as well as potentially uh, could be used for, for testing family members or at-risk family members. So the next step to ask yourself would be what lab was used. So important, it's important to know whether this is a result that you can trust, has it been verified, is it accurate? So we want to know is this a CLIA approved lab? So the CLIA is a, a regulatory body that holds labs accountable for accuracy as well as for quality control. So it would be helpful to understand if this is an actually a, is this actually a CLIA approved lab. And we also want to know were these results actually clinically validated? And this is also a very important point. Recent studies have shown that up to 40% of results from direct-to-consumer genetic tests are erroneous. So we have to understand, again, the significance and whether we can trust this result and has it been clinically validated. Does the lab require the test to be ordered by a healthcare professional? So again, this can be helpful to understand if this was a test that was motivated more by uh, a clinician or a healthcare team, or this is motivated purely by a patient, as in our case, who is interested in, in learning about their genetic risks. So again, as I mentioned, some labs do require that the test be ordered via a doctor or a genetics professional, and this is, is occurring in some cases through private pay clinics. Other labs will accept orders directly from the patients. And lastly, when should I con consult my clinical genetics colleagues? So as we learned from the first question, um, some people actually don't have access to uh, genetic health care professionals in their community. So for, tho for those who do not, this can become a more um, difficult uh, place to be, and we have to think about how do we get access and how can we in, um, expand the genetic access to, to the community. But firstly, if you have identified that your patient has a genetic disease, such as in uh, FH, this would be an appropriate reason to refer to genetic services. Um, however, if not, it's possible that a referral to genetics would not be accepted. Again, ge the genetics professionals um, may not want to see an individual who has a, a low-impact risk allele as the management and, and the counseling is probably not going to change uh, drastically. But are there other risk factors, such as a positive family history or abnormal blood work, that might indicate uh, the presence of uh, an inherited disorder or a risk for an inherited disorder? And if this is the case, you may also want to consult or reach out to your genetic colleagues and see if a referral would be appropriate. If not, again, you want to assess how impactful is this result on its own? Is it going to affect my management of the patient or even their family members? And lastly, do they have questions that can't be answered my, by my team? So often on a genetic testing report or a direct-to-consumer genetic testing report, there may be resources available. There may be a physician or a genetic counselor, again, that's incorporated into that company that you can reach out to for assistance. And if not, again, we have to think about how to manage the anxiety and the stress that these patients are incurring when they come to your office with this test of uh, a result that indicates our increased risk. So again, is there a role in working with the patient's uh, healthcare team or family doctor to sort of make sure that at least everyone is on the same page about the impact that this risk actually has or this result actually has. So we want to ask you another question. So we want to ask, are there any circumstances where you should actually recommend direct-to-consumer genetic testing to your patient? So the answers are one, never. Two, maybe in the presence of a very strong family history of cardiovascular disease. Three, I would rather refer them to a genetics clinic or counselor. Four, I am enthusiastic about genetics and will recommend direct-to-consumer genetic tests to my patients. Okay, so varied responses. 
So obviously some people feel um, a bit potentially uncomfortable in this territory and never uh, would, would request or recommend genetic testing or direct to consumer genetic testing. Um, whereas others would sort of would, if this is a question that comes up in their patient, would potentially um, speak to a genetic counselor or a genetic colleague to, to sort of gain more information about this kind of testing. And I think that's, that's, that's pretty fair. Thank you, Ariska. So um, the take-home points we're going to just leave up on the board. Uh, some questions have been percolating in. Please feel free to uh, either send me those questions, which I'll ask our panel when, when we begin. But I'm going to now invite um, uh, Heather uh, to come up and, and, and say a few words about how uh, this, as a patient, uh, has influenced her uh, thinking on this topic. I think it's quite informative. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me speak today. For the past 30 years, I've lived with ARVC. Five years ago, I tested positive for the PKP2 gene mutation. Genetic testing was helpful because it revealed the genetic cause of my heart disease. It was also supposed to be the impetus of cardiac and genetic testing for my family members. In actuality, motivating my family members to get evaluated became one of the most challenging and frustrating parts of living with my disease. As everyone in this room well knows, the ostrich effect of burying one's head in the sand when they hear bad news is alive and well. Even after 25 years, my family was in deep denial. I can't begin to tell you the frustration of watching my, tw my then 12-year-old niece compete in swimming races while I sat poolside with my sister as she tossed up every excuse in the book to evade cardiac testing. And when my brother decided to have a child on his own, in vitro testing was available to him, but he refused to hear about it. In 2014, I was diagnosed with heart failure as my ARVC progressed. Even then, my siblings did not take action to get themselves or their children evaluated. Luckily, the turning point was when my sister experienced a sudden cardiac arrhythmia event in front of me. Lucky because I recognized the warning signs and got her help, and lucky because it brought the whole situation to a head. My sister and brother finally got tested and both are negative for the PKP2 gene mutation. But given my sister's symptoms, it's probable that she and I might share another gene mutation that has not yet been discovered. If there is one take home, it is that genetic counselors must do more to psychologically support the patient who has the burden of encouraging their family members to seek medical assessment and genetic testing. Back in 2013, I got a one-page letter from the genetic counselor telling me of my PKP2 gene mutation, but nothing by way of documents or sample letters to pass on to my family members explaining ARVC, the need of getting medically evaluated, or the risk of sudden cardiac death to them and their children if it went undetected. There was no other follow-up. I felt alone. For the, with the growth of commercial genetic testing, such as 23andMe, genetic counselors are at a risk of losing their status and market share. You cannot let advertising agencies and ill-trained call center reps do your job of interpreting test results and counseling patients in distress. This means fighting for more genetic counselor positions in clinics across the country using new technologies such as Skype to communicate with remote patients and being more proactive with follow-up to newly diagnosed patients. And finally, you must look for ways to redu reduce the burden to the patients who have to inform their family members. They are already struggling with their own diagnosis and disease management. Thank you. Heather, please welcome you. Have a seat. Uh, there may be some questions because I think you truly bring uh, a, a really wonderful perspective here. Very useful. So uh, I'm going to just sort of take off and uh, again, we'll leave some of these summary points up here. Um, but um, um, uh, the first question that came in is, uh, is there a role for genetic risk score assessment in secondary prevention? So that means now you've had an event and uh, genetic risk score assessment. Who wants to tackle that one? Mel? Uh, I, um, 
Uh, no, I, I, sorry, I, I'm not sure. I think that's more of a cardiology, like cardiologist for the cardiologist, I think. <laughs> sorry, I can't answer that question very well. <laughs> Sima. Um, so I think there's been a recent couple of papers talking about polygenic risk scores for coronary artery disease, et cetera. So we can see that coming in the clinic, I think, as more robust genetic risk scores become available. But currently, I don't think there are uh, risk scores for, for disease. And as an example, even within cardiomyopathy patients, which is monogenic, we are seeing that if you have two mutations, you are more likely to have a severe phenotype that may in future be used for risk stratification. We're trying to incorporate it into a sudden cardiac death risk prediction model. But right now, I don't think those scores are clinically available. So uh, a, rel a related question, I think you touched on it. Is there a role for genetic testing if I have an idiopathic DCM? Yeah, that I can speak to a little bit better. My role is primarily in uh, the monogenic inherited heart diseases. Um, idiopathic DCM uh, is more likely to be related to non-genetic factors truly. It, it, it's not that we wouldn't necessarily find uh, monogenic condition or monogenic disease in a dilated cardiomyopathy, but we're more likely, much more likely to find those in the context of unusual clinical diagnosis, sort of early age of onset, multiple family members affected. Um, you know, your 60-year-old person with an idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy may not be the best person to initiate genetic testing on. However, there's no hard and fast rule to that, I would say. So overall, you're looking for unusual presentation of common disease to be considered uh, for genetic testing in this particular condition. And I don't know if you would sort of agree. Yeah, I, I would say that it, although the yield is lower, so 10 to 15 percent in DCM, we still offer it to families and let families decide if they want uh, to go forward. But as the price of full genome sequencing drops and as, you know, more and more genetic testing becomes available commercially at lo lower and lower cost, mm -hmm. you're going to have people who, uh, you know, are going to be presenting with this data. So this is going to be an evolving field. And I think a really relevant question, I want Josh to address this because he made the point well, well taken. If genetic testing is dynamic, how often should it be repeated? Uh, so let's so say, what, let's say yes. what we usually tell someone our patients, is non patent like there's nothing found. But yeah. what I usually tell patients who come to me and either have a negative genetic test result or an inconclusive genetic test result is that they should recontact me every couple of years or so. On average, um, within a couple of years, we do tend to discover new genes and the panels expand. I mean, they may call me in a couple of years and absolutely nothing has changed, but at least they've reached out to me and I may have something to tell them at that point. Um, how often should genetic testing be repeated? That really depends on how the medical evidence has progressed in the intervening time. One, one thing just to add to that <clears throat> is not only the actually repeating the genetic test, but the, as Josh mentioned as well, just the reinterpretation of, of the result. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the test actually has to be redone or rerun, but that the result be looked at again with the new available evidence. Um, that, that may have come out in the last, I would say probably two years might be appropriate if there's a variant of unknown significance to, to have it reassessed. And Josh, you also made the point that not having something identified doesn't mean that there isn't a genetic basis for it. So there's a question related to that. Are there pathologies that you can rule out with confidence with a genetic testing? For example, long QT. Is the answer no? The, the, no answer is, the answer is no. Yeah, even with long QT syndrome, which has a fairly um, pretty good detection rate of about 75% uh, of people with, with congenital long QT will have a mutation in one of the three most common genes. Um, we do see many, we see enough patients in our clinical practices with, again, clinically um, diagnosed long QT syndrome that don't have mutations in those genes. So there, I would say there are no uh, inherited heart diseases that can be effectively ruled out with genetic testing. With our current state current, of knowledge. Absolutely. Yeah. Probably yeah. the only exceptions to that would be a couple of rare phenocopies like Fabry disease and uh, Friedrich ataxia. But even then, I would never say it's completely ruled out if the testing is negative. Any additional questions from the audience? This is an important question, yeah. actually. 
Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I think maybe Josh wants to answer it. Just it. Came in, yeah. Yeah. So in the the question was in the 16 year old boy who presented, had he died before he could have been evaluated, uh, would genetic testing have been done, and if not, what would the approach have been for the surviving first degree relatives, where in the index case you don't really know what the genetic causes. So there are two important questions here. Do you want to address? That's a great question. Um, molecular autopsy has become more common in the last few years. Uh, I'm not sure what's happening in other geographical areas, but in Ontario, um, patients with sudden cardiac death are um, that are uh, becoming coroner's cases, they are eligible for genetic testing through funding specifically through the coroner's office. And they are performing gene panels and then returning the results to the family who are then re referred to genetics. Um, again, I don't know if what the situation is outside of Ontario, so this is very geographical specific. Um, even in cases where coroners are not arranging the genetic testing themselves, would definitely encourage you to refer families to genetics in these situations. And as a genetic counselor, what we often do is try to obtain any kind of tissues or stored blood samples that might have existed on the deceased patient and try to arrange genetic testing on those samples. And uh, this, this is actually fairly frequent in our practice, and we do often identify uh, pathogenic gene variants in deceased individuals and then offer cascade testing to family members. And I think the second question, that if you really don't have access to the genetic test, it's not possible to get it on the deceased individual, then I think it's appropriate to clinically follow the, re the rest of the family members. And if someone shows a phenotype in that event, offer them genetic testing. Any final questions, comments? Heather, anything from you? Questions from you? Well, with that, thank you all very much for attending this workshop. And please fill out your evaluations as it'll help inform whether we do a similar updated genetics uh, workshop next year. Thanks very much.